Okay, so welcome back to the tutorial number five with our next exercise sheet. Um, today, as we've already looked at labor demand and labor supply, now we'll combine these two and look at the labor market equilibrium. And in this first exercise, we should now just consider a simple labor market with the usual labor supply and demand curves. And we should just in the first step draw the labor market equilibrium describe how it is characterized and then also draw into the diagram the firm's rent and the labor income. Okay, so here's this very simple graph, which you probably are already familiar with from other classes. So we just depict our wage rate and our, our employment level. So, and then we have an upward sloping labor supply curve and a downward sloping labor demand curve. So labor supply obviously increases with increasing wage because then we have more people uh, entering the labor market who want to supply their labor. And on the other hand, with, uh, if labor gets becomes cheaper and so wage rate decreases, then obviously companies and firms will demand more labor. And then, as usual, where these two graphs, uh, for these two uh, uh, functions intersect, we have our equilibrium, where demand is equal to supply. And that is just this W star and this N star in, this, in the middle here. Okay, and then um, we can also just, uh, just show the uh, workers' incomes, which is basically just W times N, so it's just this quadratic area here and then we have our the firm's rent which is just the area above the price or in our case here the wage rate so this area A is then the rent of the firms okay um, that was then the first part and um, yeah in part B we should now uh, yeah just look at the effects of a binding minimum wage and then draw the new employment uh, uh, the new employment level and then also the resulting welfare effects. So that is depicted in this diagram. So we see then we have a binding minimum wage which means that it has to be above the equilibrium level. So if we would just implement a minimum wage that is below the equilibrium level then it wouldn't have any effect because in the end it would still end up in the equilibrium level so there's no there's with the minimum wage we cannot change the, the uh, equilibrium if it is below this equilibrium the minimum wage so we now have to implement the minimum wage is above this uh, uh, equilibrium uh, wage which we have done here so we now our equilibrium now shifts from this point here towards this point because this is the uh, minimum wage that every employer has to pay uh, and in the end what the result of that is of course is that the wage increases and the employment level decreases because at this minimum wage or this new wage um, employers just demand uh, less less labor and then we can again depict the welfare effects here. So for our workers, in the first case, our uh, workers income was this area here. And now this has, re has changed to this area here. So we actually, what they actually uh, gain is this area B, but on the other hand, they lose this area E and G. So the delta of the workers income is minus E minus G plus B. So, and yeah, explaining that just basically means that there's, of course, a certain amount of workers that lose their jobs, and these then, of course, lose their income. But those workers who remain in employment, they gain because they now get a higher wage, which is this area B. And then, on the other hand, the firm's rent also uh, decreases uh, because it was in the 
previous case it was this area and now it is just this area A, so our firms lose B and C as their rents. Okay, so this is just a simple effect of a minimum wage. And then, of course, uh, if this delta here, so you see you have uh, negative terms and positive terms to determine if this whole delta is positive or uh, the whole delta is positive or negative. This, of course, has to depend uh, depends on the size of these areas. So if this depends if this area B is larger than this area E and G. And this, of course, just has to do with the slope of our demand and supply curves, which are actually elasticities. But yeah, just, just as a side note. Okay, now in the third part of the question, we should now look at um, uh, a tax, an income tax that is applied on the wage income of workers. So workers, when they receive their income, they have to pay a tax on that, which is just a very simple lump sum tax. And yeah, then we should just look at, again, the effects on employment and then on welfare. And yeah, use again the graph. And then we should state if employers or employees are rather affected by this tax increase. Okay, so this is basically the graph here in C. So as we have said, it's it's going to be a lump sum tax. So everybody just has to pay a fixed amount of his income. Uh, this is basically just a parallel shift of the labor supply curve. So you just add the lump sum tax on top of it. So the labor supply curve just shifts upwards in this direction here. And then again, from our original equilibrium, we are shifted now upwards to this equilibrium. And what this tax does is it creates what is a so-called a tax wage. So between our original equilibrium level wage, we now have a gross wage and a net wage. So this gross wage is basically what the what the employer has to pay. But since the uh, worker then has to pay his lump sum tax on it, what he actually only gets is then this net, so net uh, uh, wage. So this here is then actually the tax rate. Okay, and yeah, then again, we can just compare the areas here to see what what the uh, welfare effects are. Um, and yeah, for the workers again, in the original case, we had this whole area as their income. And now the, it's only this area. So they actually lose the areas D, E, F, and G. And the same is the case for firms. So the original area was this area here. And now they lose, since they only get this rent now, they lose A, B, and C. So we can see that the overall effects on the welfare of firms and workers are negative. But of course here we would also have to consider that this area here is then the tax income of, of the um, the tax income of the government, which could be then be used on certain aspects to maybe compensate the losses of workers and firms. Okay, but this shouldn't be, uh, this is actually not the main question here. So in the last, for the last part two, so we can see even though the tax is only applied on the workers, so the workers have to uh, pay their tax on their income, the it also affects employers due to the impact it has on the change in equilibrium. So now also uh, firms are, um, are um, affected by this tax, although it is em the employees who actually have to pay it. So it doesn't matter uh, who actually has to pay it, if it is the employers or the employees, um, both of them will be affected due to the impact on the change in the equilibrium that this tax has. Okay. 
All right, so that was it for uh, the first uh, exercise. Now in the second exercise, we now have a firm again with a certain revenue function, which is now only dependent on labor. So this is on our only factor of production. And labor costs are just as usual, just we have our wage rate. Um, and then we have a labor supply that is given in the, cert in the form here. So of course you can see that it depends positively on wage, so with the rising wage we also get a higher labor supply. And with this two parts given we should now calculate the market clearing wage and the labor demand function in the case that neither firms nor workers can influence the market. So we have perfect competition on the labor market and we should find now the market clearing wage and the labor demand. Okay, so as usual we have here our revenue function, our supply function. So first of all, we create the profit function of the of the firm. So which is again just our production, and then the price p that is given is fixed, and then reduced by its cost. And then we just have to maximize this profit function again with respect to our only factor of production. So we take the derivative with respect to l. So then doing this in the front here, fetches you this, and then in the back we are just left with the W. And then we just have to solve for L to create our labor demand function. So we bring the W on the other side, and here in the front in the in the front here we just change the order of the exponent. Yeah, so it's basically the same. We just switch it around, we bring the minus one to the front and put it in the back and then create some brackets there. Uh, and then we just divide by alpha p to bring it on the other side. And then we can just remove this minus here. Uh, then we just also, if you do that, we have to just switch around this uh, fraction. And then we can just remove the exponent here with this counter argument. And we receive our labor demand function. Okay, and now in order to get the equilibrium, of course, we just have to uh, set it equal to the given labor supply function. Okay, so that's what we do here. So in the first step, we can just apply this exponent on both parts of the fraction here. And then we um, basically divide by 1 minus beta, bring it on this side, and we bring this w on the other side. So now we can just combine the two w's in that way. So we can just combine the exponents. So since it's a product, we just have to sum the exponents. And if we bring the, those, those ones here together, we just actually turns out to, to this exponent. So you just have to extend the fraction here and then bring this one together. And then in the next step, um, in the next step, we actually just yeah we just have to solve for the w. So we bring this exponent here with the counter argument on the other side, and then we have this here with the new exponent. So uh, what we can do in the at the top here, we see if you bring this, this is the new exponent here. And if you just uh, have two exponents, you uh, just have to uh, multiply them. And then you see that this part here and here cancels out. So we've just end up with this somehow simpler exponent. And on the bottom, we just have the normal exponent at the first that we've had here. And then we can just uh, remove this exponent uh, to the outside again, and we get this formula for our for our equilibrium wage level. Okay, so we now have our labor demand and our our uh, equilibrium wage level, and yeah, that's then in the second part. We should now assume that the firm is a imperfect discriminating monopsony and uh, show what then the optimal choice of wage and employment would be.
Okay, so monopsony is basically just the firm is the only buyer of labor. So it's basically just just the opposite of a monopoly. So we have now uh, just one one entity that is uh, demanding a certain good, and we have a lot of suppliers. So basically, just the opposite of of uh, of a monopoly. But the impact, of course, are very similar. That's just some uh, entity in the market has a certain power. Um, yeah. So in order to uh, yeah come up with the new uh, optimal choices, we now you just take our labor supply curve and solve it for our W, and then we just put this W this W we inserted into our profit function from above. So the profit function we had here, we just inserted here for the W. And then we have our new profit function here. And we can just now also, yeah, just uh, maximize it with respect to L. So then the front here, the derivation is the same as before. And here we basically just have an L, L squared. So we have the two in front and then this constant factor here and then a single single L. Okay, and then the next step we just divide by L, so we get rid of this L here, and then here if we dividing by L is basically just the same as L to the power of minus one, so we just have to add here another minus one. Um, and the next step then we just bring this one on the other side and divide by this factor alpha p here. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we just have this. And then in the next step, we uh, take the exponent of, two minus, of minus one um, so that we can change around this exponent here to two minus alpha. So it's just uh, uh, there and then um, here we just have to change the fraction again, so we'll switch it around again. And then we can just bring this exponent to the other side with a counter argument to get our new uh, optimal uh, labor or employment level for the monopsony case. Okay, and then in order to get also the wage level, we can just insert it above here this new, uh, this one, uh, we can just insert it above here in the first function that we had. And yeah, if you do that, you can see that you, uh, yeah, just basically, this is what is written here. And then uh, we can just extend the brackets. Oh, I just here want to extend the brackets. So I have to here bring a counter exponent. So you can see that if you multiply these with each other, you end up as at the exponent of one here again, and here you can basically just bring it outside, so you don't have to have an exponent here again. Okay, and then we can just remove the double fraction here, uh, which then we can, uh, yeah, basically cross off this one minus alpha with the one here, or the two here, so it becomes a one, and we just if we remove the double fraction then. Yeah, this is the final result for our new wage level. Okay, and now of course we should compare our results from the first part, so where we have uh, perfect competition with respect now in the second part where we have the monopsony. We should ch compare the wage levels and also the employment levels and then later discuss the effect of a minimum wage on that. So. So first of all, we can directly compare our the new uh, wage levels or the two wage levels in the two situations. So you can see that they look very similar. So if we have here in a monopsony case, and then here we have it in the perfect competition case. So the only difference is basically this two, and since this two is in the denominator. That means our WM is smaller than our W star. So the monopsonist obviously pays a lower wage than when there's perfect competition. Okay, and then when we want, then you have to also compare the 
uh, employment levels. For that, we actually first have to calculate the L star because we only have uh, calculated L the, the, the labor demand so far. So we just have to insert our, our W star into the labor demand function. So you see above here, we have our labor demand function and we'll just insert this here. Okay, so that then turns out to be this function here. It looks a bit quite big at the beginning, but we can just uh, yeah, simplify it in a certain way. So first of all, I've also the for the W star, I've also removed the fraction so that we don't get a double fraction. So basically you just have here a product with the exponent in, in the minus. And then we can just remove this uh, uh, the remaining fraction here. So we just have this part times this to the power of minus one. And here the minus then cancels out again, so this is removed again. So this is what we end up with. And then we can just combine the two alpha p's here. So we can just combine the exponents here, it is one. So we have one minus this exponent. And if we do that, we can just combine it, the exponent again in this way here. So if we just extend the fraction, and then you see that actually the exponents here are the same, so we can also combine the bases when we have the same exponent in this way. And then you can just basically just combine these exponents again by multiplying them. And you see then this one minus alpha here cancels out. So we end up with this L star. And this one then we can just directly compare to our uh, employment level in the labor demand. We see that uh, in the monopsony case and we see that it's also again very similar. They look very similar. So we have our monopsony labor employment level here. So it's basically the same again, just here there's a two again compared to here, there's no two. So that basically means since it's again in the denominator, we know that an employment level in the monopsony case is smaller than the optimal labor, uh, the optimal employment level. Okay, and just the last step again, we can just look at uh, what, how the situation would change when we introduce a minimum wage. So just simply plot uh, our labor supply and demand curves again. So if we do that, we see that we are potentially here. Uh, in the monopsy case, we are just below here. So we have a lower employment level and lower wage rate. So this is obviously uh, obviously not, not um, so the welfare here is not actually not maximized. So in order to maximize welfare, we could introduce a minimum wage, ideally, obviously, to maximize welfare at the equilibrium level. So this, since this actually uh, maximizes the profits of the firm and then also uh, of the workers. So we could just choose a minimum wage at this level, W star, to increase or improve the welfare. Obviously, in reality, uh, it's not uh, so obvious what this uh, W star is, so uh, it's not always possible in the reality to actually uh, yeah, introduce such a minimum wage that maximizes welfare. Okay, but we see that if we are in a situation that is not a perfect competition, then introducing a minimum wage, a binding minimum wage, would be able to improve the welfare. Okay, so that was it for uh, exercise sheet number five. Um, if there's any questions again, as before, just send me an email.